Okay, so we're going to call our meeting to order at exactly one o'clock. Good morning, council, and or good afternoon, actually, council and staff. Nice to see you. Uh, we should be fishing, but we're not. So the proceedings of this meeting will be recorded and made available on the internet. And if I could ask the clerk to conduct the roll, please. Thank you, Mayor Clarkson, are you present? I am. Deputy Mayor Windover? Present, yeah. Councillor Armstrong? Present. Councillor Franzen? Present. And Councillor Lambshead has sent his regrets. For staff, we have Donna Taggart, CAO Treasurer. Present. Steve Brockbank, Director of Emergency Services. Present. Dylan Kosh, Director of Recreation and Facilities. Present. Evan Grieger, Director of Public Works. Present. Um, Adele Arbor, Planner. Present. Ann Ruth, Deputy Clerk. Present. Sarah Dillamarter, Junior Planner. Present. Chelsea Carpenter, Waste Public Works Coordinator. Present. Suzanne Lane, Acting Deputy Treasurer. I believe Suzanne's on the line. And Lynn Holtz, Economic Development Officer. Present. And Jesse Clark, Director of Corporate Services Clerk is present. Thank you. Now we're gonna do a land acknowledgement and moment of reflection. But before I do so, I wanna just note the passing of uh, Wayne Shear. Wayne Shear has been a long, long, long time um, resident of Buckhorn, have been involved in tourist industry, but more recently he's been kind of the person who who ran the uh, Bid Euchre. So Bid Euchre is going to be missing Wayne, and uh, he and his he and his family have been uh, have been important people, and as I say he will be uh, he will be missed, especially by by our deputy mayor. <clears throat> So, land acknowledgement and a moment of reflection. We respectfully acknowledge that Trent Lakes and Peterborough County are located on the Treaty 20 Michisaugi Territory and in the traditional territory of the Michisaugi and Chippewa Nations, collectively known as the Williams Treaty's First Nation, which include Alderville, Beausoleil, Curve Lake, Georgina Island, Hiawatha, Rama, Scugog Island, and First Nations. Trent Lakes respectfully acknowledges that the Williams Treaty First Nations are the stewards and caretakers of these lands and waters in perpetuity, and that they continue to maintain this responsibility to ensure their health and integrity for generations to come. We will now take a moment to reflect on these principles and our duties and responsibilities as members of this council. Thank you. Now, at this time, I'm going to remind council members of their obligation to declare any pecuniary interest that you may have. Just, I'd just like to add, to add, they're having a celebration of life, I do believe, for Wayne on the 7th. Oh, it is? Center. Okay. Yeah, was, I think was, somebody said it was on Facebook yesterday. I'm sorry, okay. Ron. Yeah. So do you want to repeat that? Mm -hmm. Do you want <clears throat> to just repeat that? <clears throat> yeah, they're having a celebration of life for Wayne Shearer at the community center. Book on Community Center on the 7th. Okay. Yeah. Of November, that is, of course. Yeah. Right around November, say. Okay, we need I, to get. I would like to declare a possible uh, conflict of interest on uh, the water connection, and that's 10.62 on our original agenda, uh, because I, I want to teach a property that is on that water system. Okay. And that may impact the cost of the water system. Okay, so that is noted. Thank you. Uh, we need a motion to approve the agenda, please. Councillor Armstrong, Deputy Mayor Windover, all in favor. Motion has carried. Adoption of the minutes of the regular council meeting for October the 5th. Motion, please. Deputy Mayor Windover, Councillor Armstrong, all in favor. Motion is carried. Minutes and reports from committees and boards, Economic Development Advisory Committee for October the 4th and Library Board from September the 10th. Councillor Armstrong, proceed. 
Councilor Franson. All in favor, and the motion is carried. Liaison reports for council boards. Uh, council, are there liaison reports from EDAC, PRCAC, PSB, or Library Board? Anybody would like those acronyms uh, explained for whoever is listening there? I would have a go at that. <laughs> but please don't. <laughs> so, motion, please. Don't need a motion for those. Okay, thank you. Uh, statutory public meeting pursuant to the Planning Act. We need a motion to suspend the regular meeting. Councillor Armstrong, uh, Councillor Franson, all in favor? Motion is carried. Now, Sarah, could we could you introduce the first one, please, for Rabito? Through you, Madam Mayor, this is a public meeting under Section 34 of the Planning Act to consider an amendment to the Municipalities Zoning Bylaw B2014-070. A notice of public meeting for today's application containing the prescribed information was circulated to all landowners within a 120 meter radius of the subject lands at least 20 days prior to this meeting. The notice was also mailed to all prescribed agencies, public bodies, and persons in accordance with the regulations. Anyone wanting to be notified of any decision from today's public meeting must send in a written request to myself or the clerk, and the notice of passing will be mailed to them, setting out the method and manner in which appeals may be made to the Ontario Land Tribunal. Please note that if a person does not send a written comment prior to the passing of the bylaw or make an oral submission at a public meeting, that person may not be entitled to appeal the decision. So this is a public meeting for file number 21-17 to consider a zoning bylaw amendment submitted by Agent Craig Layton of Reno This Contracting for property owners Bob and Linda Rubito for a shoreline lot located on 37 Fire Road 98A on Eels Creek. The subject lands have a shoreline frontage of approximately 28 meters or 92 feet and a lot area of approximately 1,710 square meters or 18,406 square feet. The property is currently zoned shoreline residential private access. The applicant wishes to construct a new dwelling with an attached garage and partial second story having a ground floor area of 214 square meters and a total floor area of 316 square meters. The new dwelling would also include a deck with a floor area of 75.8 square meters. In order to construct the proposed dwelling, the applicant would require the following relief from the zoning bylaw. One, an increase to the ground floor area of the existing 76.32 square meter dwelling of more than 50% to permit the construction of a 214 square meter replacement dwelling. The total gross floor area of the two-story replacement dwelling is proposed to be 316 square meters. Two, a reduction to the 12 meter minimum setback from a private right away to 10.12 meters for the construction of the proposed replacement dwelling. Three, a reduction to the 30 meter minimum water yard setback to 9.37 meters, which is maintaining the existing non-compliant water yard setback to the existing dwelling of 9.36 meters. The applicant has submitted an environmental impact study by Cambian Incorporated in support of the application. There is a planning report on the agenda from the Munici municipality's planning consultant, Chris Jones. Page one of the report incorrectly labels Eels Creek as Pigeon Lake. Chris's report identifies that the applicant's site plan suggests the proposed dwelling represents a substantial rebuild compared to the existing dwelling, but that the existing shoreline setback would be the same and the new dwelling would be compliant with all other zone regulations, including lot coverage. He noted that the application is generally consistent with the provincial policy statement and growth plan. The municipality has not yet received correspondence from Peterborough Public Health. The municipality has received a comment from Kawartha Pine Ridge District School Board who have no objections to the proposed amendment. 
Further, if any members of the public did not register with the clerk indicating their intent to make an oral submission, who would like to at this time, please use the raise a hand feature so we are able to promote you in order for you to make an oral submission. Thank you. Do we see anybody from the public who would like to have a comment? And if not, can I ask if there are comments from council? Everybody okay? So, uh, are you okay with that, Sarah? Do you, did anybody appear there that wanted to say something or shall we? are we okay to move on? I believe we're good to move on. Thank you. So can we have a motion to reconvene the regular meeting, please? Uh, Deputy Mayor Windover and Councillor Franson, all in favor? Motion is carried. Business arising from the statutory public meeting, uh, Sari, uh, Sarah uh, Delameter, Junior uh, Planner, Zoning Bylaw Amendment, number 2021 for Rabito. Thank you, through you, Madam Mayor. There was a public meeting held for file number 2117. At this time, staff are recommending that council receive the report and defer making a decision on the application until the following have been completed to the council's satisfaction. One, the author of the environmental impact study reviews and endorses the site plan as being reflective of the conclusions and recommendations of the environmental impact study. Two, the applicant obtains a permit for a class four septic system. And three, the applicant enters into a site plan agreement with the municipality of Trent Lakes. Okay, sounds good. Can we have a motion for that, please? Councilor Branson? Now, did you also want to comment or just motion? No, just motion. Okay, and Deputy Mayor Windover is our seconder. All mm -hmm. in favor? Mm -hmm. Motion is carried. Now, we've got a presentation and we'll now have uh, from Jeff Dover. Travis Traney and Andrew Waddington from S FS Strategy Incorporated regarding the Buckhorn Sports Pad Feasibility Study. Please unmute your radio, your audio, and your share your camera and make your presentation. You will have 20 minutes. I'll ask council that all questions are saved until the end of this presentation. Okay, thank you, um, Madam Mayor. Um, Travis is going to. Oh, uh, we, we um, that's the report we had sent a presentation. Yeah. Uh, is that going to come out or can we have access to the, uh, the screen? Okay. Um, I guess we'll do it without the uh, the, the presentation, but uh, Travis, you were going to start us off. Yeah, for sure. Um, so thank you all. I'll try and get through this as uh, efficiently as we can to save some time for questions and discussion at the end. Uh, I'm just going to start by going over the our scope of work. Uh, basically, we were trying to determine the top three recommended options uh, to increase the skating season at the Buckhorn Sports Pad. Uh, so in doing that, we reviewed all um, current situation data was provided by the municipality, as well as um, conducting interviews with uh, stakeholders. Uh, we also conducted a benchmarking and best practice uh, interviews with existing facilities, and we tried to include, we did include uh, facilities with um, the three different types options that we were looking at, which was natural ice, artificial ice or refrigerated ice, and synthetic ice. Uh, we also conducted interviews uh, with some local demand, uh, potential user groups, just to determine local demand. Uh, if we were looking at doing some cost recovery, what kind of an appetite or uh, unmet demand were, was there in the area? And we used our findings to basically do our current state uh, feasibility assessment and uh, come up with those um, top options for the municipality. So just high level from the from our current situation analysis, uh, we we did review a number of, of reports that were already prepared, including the facilities master plan. Um, and in that report, it does say uh, correctly that 80 that most of the, the citizens in the municipality, I think it was 84%, do have access to an ice surface within a 30-minute drive. Um, the population of uh, of Trent Lakes is is growing, and uh, with uh, with with the current I guess trend of um, remote 
uh, remote working, uh, especially with uh, younger professionals and younger families, those numbers could increase further. Um, but that aside, we were trying to look at um, the number of usable days currently at the Buckhorn Sports Pad. And um, year over year, those numbers have been decreasing. I'm on slide five right now. Perfect. Uh, so yeah, like I said, those the number of usable days are decreasing. On the next slide, we have a, a short exhibit summarizing the, that decrease. The next slide. So although the, and we looked at, at temperatures as well, trying to figure out a, a reason, I guess, as to the as to the decline. You can see in the second column there the number decreasing from 70 usable days down to 40 in uh, 19 in 2020 with an estimated 31 usable days based on weather, if the sports pad had opened during the pandemic. Um, so if you're looking at the temperatures there, although the average monthly temperature uh, do not seem to correlate directly with the number of, of days that the sports pad was open, um, other outdoor natural ice pads that we've interviewed as part of the benchmarking uh, process did report similar numbers in usable days. And then maybe due to weather conditions, if it's just a greater number of consecutive mild days in a row while making ice or just consecutive mild days with greater temperatures more extremes in temperatures um, but either way the, the main finding was the best practices for natural ice services were being conducted properly at the buckhorn sports pad they have the, the biggest issue is is sun so with with the roof covering and with the shades uh, especially when they do the, the proper um, ice maintenance they're doing all the right things to extend the season as much as they could for natural ice. Um, so as a result, we were looking, if we're looking to extend the season there. We need to explore other options besides natural ice. Uh, so on the next slide here, we can summarize uh, next slide again, our primary research. So when we were conducting benchmarking and best practices, like I said, we reached out to a number of different facilities. Uh, we spoke a little bit about natural ice already. Um, I'm talking about artificial ice, which is the refrigerated ice again. Um, that can extend uh, a season even for an outdoor rink um, considerably. Um, basically, you can make artificial ice outdoors in temperatures of up to 15 degrees Celsius. It's a lot more expensive, but you can do it. So a lot of the places, including the city of Toronto and city of Brampton, uh, they run their outdoor ice, artificial ice season from November through to March. Um, there are different options. You can do a permanent slab with a refrigeration system or you can do a temporary where you basically have the refrigerated coils laid on top of a, of a of a slab you make your ice and then at the end of the year you take it out have to store it and put it in every year uh, we're looking at synthetic as well and this is something that brampton actually did last year they installed an outdoor synthetic pad as well as some um, artificial pads with that removable system and um, the two big learnings there is uh, they already want to switch to the permanent, you know, although they did save some capital putting in the uh, the temporary artificial system. The amount of uh, of labor involved in put taking putting it in and taking out, storing it, potentially damaging the coils in that transition, uh, weren't really worth it. So they're already looking at uh, at putting in a permanent um, outdoor artificial system, and for their synthetic option. Although it's much cheaper to operate it because there's no refrigeration obviously involved, um, the biggest issue were complaints with users. It's a very different feel to the ice, um, very different than natural ice, and uh, it, does, it still does require maintenance itself, cleaning and conditioning with lubricant. So it, it was it was it was not uh, from a financial perspective it was good to you know it's, it's there it's able to be used, um, but it was not an optimal decision. Um, for them. So looking at the next slide here, at the demand interviews, we conducted with a number of uh, potential user groups in the area. Um, during those interviews, again, there was little demand with these groups for that synthetic ice option, especially with the hockey groups. Um, as far as regional demand goes, um, the location of the sports pad would be ideal for Ennismore minor hockey. Um, the usage there would be primarily practices, as uh, the NSMR coaches have one game a week with one practice on their current ice. Uh, however, many of the coaches would prefer to do two or three practices uh, if ice were consistently available at a reasonable price. 
um, Lakefield minor hockey, on the other hand, they have all their um, their own minor hockey league needs met with their current facilities. However, they do have some rep teams and they're looking to expand that, that program. And that's where, again, the extra ice time would be required for additional practices. Um, Curve Lake First Nation, there's definitely demand there for youth and recreational activities, uh, as well as um, some practices as they participate in the, um, the little the Native Hockey League, they do that tournament in, in Mississauga every year. So there's teams there involved that they would want to do some practicing as well. And they were also as a community considering adding artificial ice, if unless it's done in Buckhorn first, of course. Um, there is also currently some overflow demand in the surrounding areas uh, from Peterborough, as they're currently down in arena. Um, and Peterborough has not yet secured funding to rebuild a new facility, but they're going to continue to pursue this. Um, There's also a potential demand for learn to skate and men's leagues uh, that was also gathered as part of this and all these demands assumptions as well as acceptable um, ice rental rates uh, were all used are all going to be used like, later in the in the cost recovery model. Uh, but um, before we get to that on the next slide here, I'll just introduce Andrew. He's going to go through some of the capital cost estimates for our different options. Thank you, Travis. Just one more slide and we'll get started. So based on the findings that Travis just spoke about, uh, we narrowed this down to, I've got to count these now, six scenarios. Uh, the, a, the A series scenarios are based on outdoor artificial ice, uh, uh, sorry, outdoor at the same size that you currently have uh, with a permanent ice system, which would be your refrigeration system is built into the concrete slab, it's permanent. The removable ice system, which Travis discussed is something that gets it gets, uh, the tubes get rolled out each season. You have to disassemble the uh, disassemble the boards, reassemble them on top of the ice once the ice is made, so it's labor labor intensive. And we have to store those store those rolls of of tubes in the off season. And the third the third of the A series was that synthetic ice that uh, Travis spoke about. The B and C series are all based on an NHL size ice rink, so it's it's, it's increasing the footprint of your current rink significantly. Um, and it would mean that you can't recover, you can't reuse uh, facilities that you currently have, such as the, the current support building or the or the roof over the current ice piece. For each of these scenarios, a number and the uh, scenario C is an indoor NHL rink, so it would be extend your season a bit more, give you a bit more facilities to work with. Um, the uh, in all of these scenarios, we worked with a mind to keeping costs as low as possible. So wherever there is an opportunity to reuse existing infrastructure, we've assumed that that's possible, and we've and we've built that into our assumptions on on price as well. So for the existing rink, for example, in scenario A1, we would be keeping everything exactly the way it was, building in a, an additional building to support the refrigeration system, and only cutting out this part of the slab that exists underneath the roof currently as required to install the new permanent um, ice refrigeration system. In the scenario, uh, the second scenario, it's similar to that, only we don't need to cut the slab out and install anything because the rolls would, the, the tubes would roll out on top of the existing slab. Um, and uh, scenario three, we're looking at uh, removable tiles that Travis discussed with synthetic ice. For the scenarios B, uh, B1 and B2, we'd be, you'd be basically raising it to the ground uh, and rebuilding rebuilding your facilities um, from scratch because you need a, a larger larger pad, larger building to support that and, and so on. Uh, and obviously the indoor the indoor scenario um, requires even more space. So if we can move on to the, the next slide, we can sort of introduce what this looks like from a capital perspective. And these are pre-designed, so they, they are, there is a fairly sizable range there. And there's ways to, you know, be higher or lower based on the final design and certain site conditions. But it's important to understand how much that can that can range there. Um, so you can see that for the uh, scenario A1, we're looking at anywhere from 900,000 to 1.2 million. Uh, A2 is uh, close to 600,000 to close to 800,000. Uh, scenario A3 would be 600,000 to 750. Um, and then when we get into the NHL size, obviously, because we're building a new roof over top of the ice, we're building a new slab and and uh, deconstructing the existing facilities as well, we, we step up in price substantially. 
uh, to three million to three to four million for B two uh, B one. Uh, 2.7 to 3.6 million for B2. And of course the indoor one, which includes the cost of a building uh, is, is the most substantial capital investment. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll take over from here. So um, if we could just go to the next slide, please. Um, we just, we wanted to, to look, so Andrew's discussed the capital cost we also want to look at ongoing operating costs. Um, so we, we've done the uh, the status quo, um, which is uh, in the Buckhorn pad as it was op as it is operating today. Uh, and the first thing we did was we we took a look at uh, the hours. Uh, we have assumed um, doing the uh, uh, if you expand and, and uh, go to artificial ice that uh, the uh, operation of the arena would be taken over uh, by the municipality. Uh, so the uh, hours um, in the recreation department have uh, increased significantly. Uh, the synthetic ice option, um, which we're, we're not uh, really recommending, uh, I think part of the problem there that, that uh, Travis didn't mention is use of the facility for non-ice uh, related things. and. Uh, um, you know, a lot of the uh, facilities using them, for instance, won't let you use black hockey tape, won't let you use black pucks. Um, so that just tells you how um, hard it is to keep these things clean and all that. So you either need to take them out to, to use it. You know, you do pickleball now, farmers markets now, um, Canada Day now. So it's less um, operating. It can probably have a, a more of a volunteer component there, but uh, we thought with the ice plant, um, with the requirements um, that it, it would be uh, staffed by the municipality. So the, the labor costs, as you can see, are significantly more in all but the synthetic ice scenario. On the next slide, uh, we were looking at other operating costs. Um, really, um, the big operating costs, uh, other than uh, labor, the, the primary operating cost, it, it comes to be utilities. Um, so for all scenarios A and B, you know, we can throw out the A3 scenario because you could have ice all year um, if you wanted to go that route. But for all those, uh, the other facilities, we've assumed a three month, uh, you know, uh, Travis was talking about November to March in, in some of the municipalities. It's much more expensive. So if you were gonna add a month, um, to uh, an outdoor ice, you, you couldn't take that 40,000 divided by the three months we uh, we uh, projected and, and, and go more. As the temperatures heat up, the utilities expand, uh, the utility price expands significantly. So you can extend the ice season, but this, uh, this, uh, these operating projections we have here, um, we base that on three months, um, you know, basically um, mid-December to, to, to mid-March or uh, sort of thing. Uh, anyway, so that it shows you that the operating costs and um, we don't have insurance for, for the current situation. Utilities aren't being charged to the sports pad right now. I believe the Buckhorn Community Center is covering the utilities. It's it's pretty minimal. It's the lights uh, and, and a little bit of uh, hydro for the buildings. Um, but uh, it, it does show you that there's going to be a significant increase in operating costs. So one of the other things we did, if we could go to the next slide, we talked about potential cost recovery. Um, so um, it depends. Uh, we're, we're not totally advocating a move. We're not advocating a, a move away from the, the, the way the system is now where um, and, and use the facility as you please with, um, you know, guidelines on what types of groups are are uh, allowed or uh, encouraged at, at certain times. Uh, but we looked at the uh, the potential to, to rent the ice, uh, what we believe the uh, rent would be in $2, any $21. Um, it, you know, uh, so we, we looked at that. The, the thing is, I, you know, I believe that these are very achievable. As consultants, you tend to be conservative. We don't want to overstate um, what happens. There, there is a lot of ice um, just outside the municipality that these groups use. But um, one of the key things is that 
people want the best ice time. Uh, prime time ice is, is defined as six to 11 or six to midnight in some jurisdictions on, during the week and, and, and you know 7 a.m. to 11 or midnight on weekends. There's more attractive ice, right? The, the six o'clock is hard for people to get to. Um, the late at night is, is not as attractive. So there tends to be a shift um, away from those less attractive prime time ice to the to the, the attractive prime time ice. So you know I do believe these are are significant uh, you know achievable. We we thought we thought about off season uh, rental revenues. Um, we talked about um, uh, you know but the only thing that we don't really have the board advertising is still here. I'm oh, sorry this is just the uh, Ice time, but um, um, if you could go to the next slide, um, you know, then you could also do naming rights or or something like that, uh, you know, to 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 get some more avenue. But uh, what we've done is we've assumed the maximum what we think you can do in terms of cost recovery, um, and looked at what the operating subsidy would be for all of these scenarios. Um, and as you can see, there's an operating there's an operating uh, subsidy required in all of them. Uh, the minimum operating subsidy assumes that you are renting ice, um, and the uh, we don't we don't have any naming rates or anything on on this. And the uh, annual operating size uh, um, subsidy without ice rental is it's kind of like the the today uh, current situation model. Um, you know, uh, the, it's available and uh, the community can come use it uh, when they want. It's probably not a feasible option for option C, um, you know, with an indoor facility, but the other ones, it could certainly be that way. And it shows you the difference in, in the annual operating subsidies that we believe that you would have to go. And with that, I believe that's the end of our, our presentation. We're, oh, sorry. Yeah, and, and we did, you know, our, our goal or our uh, scope of work was to come up with the three scenarios that we think um, the municipality could use to best extend the um, uh, number of ice, uh, uh, the, the number of uh, operating days at the Buckhorn Sports Pad. So we came up with the uh, permanent system as being the best. Um, you know, in my mind, uh, one of the things was going to be status quo and trying to come up with ways to extend the ice season with natural ice. Um, as we said, the uh, the municipality and the the Buckhorn Sports Pad Volunteer Committee are doing best practices. Uh, I don't think that you could really um, extend it. Um, you know, I think there's going to be colder winters. There's going to be warmer winters with the general um you know warming up so but i you know i don't think that you could reasonably expect to extend the the ice season with the current situation so we came up with these three ones and we've just kind of summarized the capital cost ranges and the uh the operating subsidy that the municipality would have to consider under all of these um situations and i believe that one is the last slide that we had and uh we're happy to go back and take questions on any uh, of the previous slides or uh, any other questions that council might have um, look forward to doing that thank you jeff and andrew and travis questions i have a couple uh, comments and, and a question uh first of all the kin mount arena within their municipality and so is the fairgrounds they they were listed on the bridge and so is the buckhorn sports pad um I thought the focus was on rentals and hockey, and uh, my feeling is that that should be used for recreational skating. And I, I prefer it to be free because the cost to a family that has three or four children uh, it could be fairly significant at six or seven dollars per person. And I didn't see anywhere in there about the cost of. The re rehabilitating the ball diamond, which would be used with, for the septic. And I, I uh, was curious about using well water for ice. I heard it's not appropriate for ice making. So would there have to be any kind of storage facility? Um, I'll take the first one and then pass on to Andrew. If we could go forward uh, or backwards, I guess, a few slides. 
there is something I, I did leave out. Um, let me see, uh, previous to that. Oh, no, sorry, Akita, and try 15 or 16. Uh, 16. So, so what one one thing I, I meant to, to talk about, um, Councillor Friends, and um, so we, we took the the total number and the, the bottom three rows here, um, the prime time hours for community use that would be available. So right now, you know, based on um, the number of operating days, um, there's 526 prime time hour. And you know what? I didn't. I know you can go all night. We we kind of kept it from 7 a.m. till uh, 11. Uh, so there's 812 hours available for community use as we extend that season. Um, you know, I, I just let, you know, because in the back of my mind, I, I love what you've done there. I love the fact that that facility is available. So I, in the back of my mind, I wanted to make sure as we go through forward that there would be uh, hours available for community use. And as you can see, um, the, the NHL size scenarios, you know, we think you can uh, rent more ice. Um, but, you know, if you maximize that ice rental potential, there's less hours available. Um, for community use, but in all the other scenarios, there there is uh, more hours for community use. However, um, I will say that the the ability to rent ice it, it is at those most attractive times, right? And um, that would be probably the most attractive times for community use. It's reasonable to assume that. So, while there are more hours, um, those good hours would, uh, if you choose to go to the, the maximum cost recovery route. Um, those good hours would be uh, um, taken up by uh, by groups, uh, by rental groups. You know, uh, there could be a policy put in on on what hours remain for community uh, use, but then that uh, potential cost recovery uh, would be decreased. And then Andrew, I'll let you handle uh, Councillor Franzen's other questions if you can. So the two questions I think that are remaining were the baseball diamond and use of well water for the ice. Uh, tackle the ice, the water first. Um, the assumption made in the cost in the cost estimates is that if the current water was sufficient now, it was sufficient in the future. If that's not the case, then you then you're correct. We'd have to probably put in something there for storage of, of water for for the season, which is not currently included in the in the cost estimates. With regards to the baseball diamond, we did not do a cost estimate for relocating, but you are correct putting a septic system in any of these scenarios to handle the washrooms is going to encroach on the field. So it may not be a large piece in some of the scenarios, but it's still a part of the field that you can't play on top of without potentially damaging your septic system. Uh, yeah. The cost for the cost Sorry. for baseball diamond is going to, is going to uh, be different depending on where it moves to. And we, we did not, you know, we weren't looking for another location for it, but you're correct. That is not included in the current cost. Jeff, you were going to say something. I cut Just you off. One question on the hockey: uh, Is there uh, any uh, extra maintenance, uh, wear and tear, and uh, uh, life uh, of the facility with having uh, organized hockey? I, I, I think that would have a stronger impact than recreational skating or uh, or shitty hockey. <laughs> there will be puck marks everywhere. <laughs> I was funny. I was uh, I was in a an arena. You know, it's it's starting up again, which is is great for me. But uh, I was laughing uh, just this weekend at a sign no playing with pucks that had puck marks all over it. Um, <laughs> yes, um, you know, hockey, hockey more than public skating uh, for sure um, has uh, wear and tear. But we we have. Um, uh, you know, the, I, I'm confident we looked at enough of um, comparables. I'm, I'm really confident with the, uh, the, the with the repair and maintenance uh, estimates we we have that that uh, those are are covered. But um, you know, I mean, if you're putting a facility like this together, you want to maximize the use. Um, there's you know different types of uses for pads. Hockey is is one of them. And yes, yeah, so if you have um, you know 30 uh, hockey players on the ice, they're gonna do more wear and tear in you know over time than you know having figure skaters on the ice or or just public skaters. But uh, we believe that the repair and maintenance um, projections that we prepared are 
covering you know the scenario that we're looking at um the uh, you know uh, the rentals we looked at there there was a uh, figure skating and a learn to skate group that that you know expressed uh interest in and in having some ice um as well as hockey um the smaller scenarios are probably uh practice i think they're all practice really except for the the indoor but i believe we have considered that yes and i'd like to thank you all uh for the report it's a very comprehensive report and it was a good read thank you <laughs> thank you anybody else questions you had some i do thank you madam mayor um and through you um Thank again. Thank you for the report. I think this finally brings together the, the data and the financials that we need um, to move forward and, and consider this and make make an appropriate decision. Um, I came away from the report with five uh, key takeaway messages, and I guess I would like to go through them and just ask if at the end, if you can just confirm to me that that none of them are in contrary uh, or contrary to what's in the report itself. Um, so number one, um, the size and the age distribution of our year-round population, which is about 32% of the total population, does not easily justify an investment of a million to $9 million. Whether it's funded by the municipality or another level of government, I don't see a compelling needs or benefits case, especially since 84% of the municipality has access to an ice service within a 30-minute drive. Um, number two, the report assumes, and I think this is appropriate, that responsibility for the maintenance and operational management would shift to the municipality. Um, this means that uh, some new job skills and responsibilities would be added to our mix. That includes marketing, scheduling, and supervision. Um, this is a pretty quantum leap in the level of municipal resources dedicated to recreation and facilities, and that new balance of resource allocation would need to be considered. Uh, number three, other than advertising revenues, incomes, income to offset the annual operating costs would come almost exclusively from groups outside the municipality, which is a heavy reliance with no guarantee from others. Um, not to mention the potential perceived discrimination or discriminatory pricing around charging outsiders for our ice time, but not our own. Uh, number four, the report points out, and you talked to it a little bit, Jeff, um, that ice rental times most desirable to outside groups are the prime times, which are the very same hours when most of our community would like to be skating. So that's a real conflict um, and a real issue uh, needs to be addressed, but certainly that would impact the available rental hours and income. And number five, I think as important, if not more important, any of the options uh, for artificial ice, and I think you've excluded synthetic, will operate at a deficit. The best case, even if we were able to uh, attract maximum rental income, is about $140,000 a year, and it ranges up to a worst case of $540,000 a year. $140,000 translates into a tax rate increase of 1.4% a year. And I guess I would ask the question, do we really want to saddle our future taxpayers with an additional burden of a minimum of $140,000 per year? So just uh, Jeff, to you and, and the panel, is there anything that I've said other than sort of questions here that are contradicted by what's in the report? Uh, no, I don't think that there's anything you said that contradicts what's in our report. Um, we did not, uh, you know your your first point um we did not look at we were looking at the ways to extend the the season at the buckhorn sports pad so uh we did look at some of the work that had been done previously um but um yeah you, you know we didn't do uh an analysis of community use we we don't the the, the buckhorn um sports pad committee uh, i hope i got the the name right um, didn't track, you know, the, the hours of usage and all that. I, I really love the program. Um, you know, we were just looking at three ways to extend it. And like I said, when I was doing the presentation, in my mind, I was, you know, one of the key things that I wanted to do was say, you know, how can we help them use natural ice and, and extend that ice season? And, and we quickly realized, you know, I, I guess within five minutes or as soon as I saw it, um, 
you know, they've done some great jobs to to extend that that season. So I, I just want to put that out there. Um, the one thing that that is preserved um, is use by the school. Um, and they might be able to be uh, used more when they if they know um, the arena is going to be up and running for these three, three, uh, three months, um, you know, as opposed to having to make plans on on the warm days when we get our thoughts. But yeah, I guess I'm, I'm rambling on and, and repeating some of the stuff I said before. But yes, Councillor uh, Armstrong, I think uh, there, there's nothing that you said that uh, we, we didn't have uh, in our analysis. Great. Thank you very much. Um, Deputy Mayor Wendover. No, I'm just taking the report. No. Okay. I'm going to make a couple of comments. Um, the amount of supervision that I've done down there, I have a pretty good idea as to when the public use it. So for the most part, the times that practices would be, uh, would be taking place would not be at the same time that the public use it. The public have... Uh, they tend to be in Saturday mornings, uh, and if you have five or six hours, you get the same amount of people as you do if you have two hours. So as long as it's scheduled and it's uh, and it's uh, marketed that way, there will be enough free time. The major draw for doing this in the first place was for the kids, because 16 years ago there was a there was a uh, a meeting held, and it's when they formed the uh, community policing. And the question to community policing was, if we form this, what should we do? And the, uh, the commander at the time said, do something for kids because this area has absolutely nothing to do for children. And I'll tell you, you go by there at 11 o'clock at night and you see 18 or 20 teenagers in there playing shinny, those kids could easily be hanging around somewhere, smoking this or smoking that or something else. So yes, there's a cost, but there's also a cost in not uh, looking after our children. Until that rink came there, the children that went to school in Buckhorn had one half uh, day a year at the Lakefield School, at the Lakefield Arena, and that included busing time. So they ended up on the ice for about a half an hour. So I think somewhere along the line, our priorities have to be, uh, have to be uh, recognized. Economic development, uh, children can no longer be left on the sidelines. If parents do not find things for children to do, oftentimes the parents will go somewhere else. Uh, my experience in that is growing up as a child in the summer resort business. The parents used to come in, father would take the motor off the, out of the car, put it on the boat and away he would go. And at the end of the week, he put it back on and the family would leave. Well, as time went on, the kids came in and said, can we do this, do this, do this? And if they couldn't do this, this, and this, the people went somewhere else. Sports facilities for children is exactly the same. Parents today are aware of the advantages to keeping little minds busy. Does it come with a cost? Absolutely. Does it come with a cost if we ignore these situations and we let these children grow up willy-nilly? So I... At this point, I would like to make a motion that we accept this report. And, uh, and yep. Okay, I will. And, uh, and okay, I'm removed. Okay, I'm over here. Mm -hmm. Am I removed now? Yep. <clears throat> okay. I'd like to make a motion. Yeah. Let's go back to your seat. Just Deputy Mayor Wendover, you're now the chair of the meeting. Well, Mayor well, Clarkson. Well, I'm removed. Oh. Okay. So I'd like to make a motion that we uh, accept this report and uh, wait until we have a full council to discuss how we move forward with it. And we would call for a seconder. I would second that motion. I think it's certainly deserving okay. of having our, our full complement here. Okay. All in favor? I, 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 comments, want, but... I agree, but I, I wanted just to make one comment. Sure. Uh, we're talking about 30% of the children that live within this municipality. What are we going to do for the other 70%? I guess you got to start somewhere, Peter. You got to start somewhere. Anyway, um, we'll have a, once we get our entire council back. Just move that area. Yeah, just take the outcome. Pass motion. 
Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you uh, for the opportunity. And, you know, I, I, we really enjoyed this. We were really impressed with the community spirit, with the, the building and uh, operating the sports pad, the uh, community center and all that. You've got a great town. Uh, congratulations. And uh, thanks again for uh, the opportunity to work with you. Jeff, can I ask you a question? If you're doing this, and I should have asked this before, if you're doing this work, how many of the uh, rinks that you see are doing this type of thing, or are they are they moving up to where they put something in that's a little bit more permanent? Like, are the days of the of the um, two walls or three walls are they are they being phased out in other than just parks and things, or what's what is your feeling there? Um, I think there's a lot. There's still um, unorganized. Um, uh, there's a lot of uh, communities that are, are doing natural ice, you know, or the, the municipality will set up the boards, um, you know, just on a field and, and they got some flat green space and, uh, you know, community volunteers will maintain that for as long as they can. Um, so there is still some of that. There, there's definitely a move to more permanent. Um, the number of outdoor artificial rinks um you know uh, that they have grown um for sure uh the, the number uh in ontario um the number of those ha have increased um you know moving to more permanent i think the big difference is um you know kids today um more program than we were you know less um you know go off and do your own thing uh, you know changing world uh, sort of thing so it, there is a move towards more permanent facilities, but the, you know, those legacy type things are, are still exist and are still, a, I think, a big fun part of Canadian winters. Um, so th there is a mix, but it's not, you know, I, st I still see, you know, programs that people will build natural ice um, and let communities volunteer and, and do those, but that, um, you know, it's amenity that some municipalities are able to offer as well. Did you want to add something, Travis? Yeah, if I may. Um, and just, just building on that, and the it's part of the benchmarking study we were doing. I mean, even talking to the city of Toronto, they do a, lot, a large number of outdoor artificial pads, but they also still do that you know, community um, volunteer organized natural natural pads as well. Um, but um, specifically, when we, we did an interview with um, the Carling Township, which is a small municipality just north of uh, Perry Sound. And they're basically in the exact same situation that, that you guys are in and they have a, a natural an outdoor natural ice rink and they're seeing they, the usable days just go down and down and they're looking at having um installing an outdoor artificial ice pad and they're in a process right now of getting prices to do just that Thank you. okay uh can we if there are no more questions can we move forward sure. okay Staff reports, public works, Chelsea, waste. And you're going to speak about uh, hours of transfer stations. I am, thank you, Mayor Clarkson, and through you. This report provides council with additional information as requested at the May 18th council meeting. Transfer station staff have compiled data from March 21st until September 30th of this year tracking the number of cars that have come through each site on Sundays during the times that would be affected by the proposed changes. A summary of the results finds that for the Bob Cajun transfer station, an average of 8.6% of visitors utilize the site during the times that would be affected by the proposed changes. For the Buckhorn transfer station, an average of 7.3% of visitors utilize the site during the times that would be affected by the proposed changes. For the Cavendish transfer station, an average of 12.2% of visitors utilize a site during the times that would be affected by the proposed changes. And for the Crystal Lake transfer station, an average of 10.8% of visitors utilize a site during the times that would be affected by the proposed changes. 
Furthermore, and as indicated in my report, the local provincial officer with the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks has stated that operating the sites outside of daylight hours would be a contravention of the environmental compliance approval condition, which is legally enforceable. It is therefore recommended that the transfer station hours of operation be amended as outlined in my report in order to ensure compliance with this regulation and ensure the municipality does not face penalties. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to ask for questions and I know somebody who's got one. <laughs> I do. Thank you through you, Madam Mayor. Um, thanks, Chelsea, for this. And thank you to you and all the attendants for collecting the data. I know that's an extra job on top of the, their already sometimes difficult job. I have one comment uh, and one question. Uh, the comment is, uh, hard to say is 12 or 10 percent of vehicles visiting during that 6 to 8 p.m. period a lot or a little. Um, I think you could argue it either way, but what I would suggest is that for the 1,522 cars that visited a transfer site between 6 and 8 on Sundays, mm -hmm. that's pretty important to them and it's a reasonably high number. So the question is around this and, and I think I'd suggest you look into this. Um, in the summer months, we have five months, May through September. May, April, June, and July, for all of those months, um, open until eight o'clock, darkness is not a problem. The sun sets well after eight o'clock. Um, so the only month that is an issue is September. And we seem to have stuck with a solution that changes five months in order to fix a one month problem. So my question is why haven't we looked at simply changing the hours for September and uh, why couldn't that be one of the options? I, and I know there's some issues around hours, et cetera, but um, those things can be adapted, I would think, to uh, still meet the requirements. So that's my question. Why didn't we just change the hours? for? I, mean, I have no problem with the winter hours. Um, I don't think anybody has. It's really the issue of summertime residents who visit the transfer site on their way home and who want to extend their weekend as long as possible. And uh, those are the 1,522 people who uh, came between six and eight on Sundays. Chelsea, would you like to comment? For you, Mayor Clarkson, it's a very valid question, Councillor Armstrong. Um, so I'm not sure if you're um, meaning that we would have a set different set of hours for the month of September, but I can speak to all angles that you may be um, referencing. So um, if we were to just change the transfer station hours in September, we would then be left with three different sets of hours of operation, which would create a lot of confusion. We already have confusion when we transition from summer hours to winter hours and vice versa. Um, but I can speak, if you're talking about shortening the duration of summer hours, that would have a result in a decrease of hours for staff, as well as a, a level of service for all residents. Because right now, like you mentioned, um, we have summer hours from May 1st to September 30th. Should we look at changing summer hours to be, for example, from uh, May 15th or June 1st to September 30th to avoid that awkward transition of daylight hours. We would be um, decreasing the hours for our staff, which I think would have a negative effect on employee morale and also decreasing the level of service for all of our residents as the sites are open an additional day um, during the summer hours. So we would be taking that away. So there would be uh, winter hours in effect longer than the summer hours. So thank you for that. I just want to follow up if I may. Um, no, what I, and obviously it's up to staff to work the, the different options, but you know, certainly one option would be to keep May 1st through August 31st exactly as it is. There's no issue with the sunset. Um, so we don't have a safety and health issue. So the only month that we would consider changing would be September if and it may or may not be an issue if it staff feels it's an issue of confusion um, to have a separate set of hours for september it could shift to winter hours and yes i guess we lose four days or four mornings of availability at two sites um, which could be added somewhere else for the attendance if it's a if it's an issue so i, I just don't see why that wasn't an option that was considered 
again, we're using a five month change to solve a one month problem. Councillor Franson? Yeah, I, I was wondering if we could uh, uh, leave the winter hours as they are, but the summer hours just uh, be open from 11 to 7 because uh, it, at least we're gaining, I think 6 is too early, but I think 7 may accommodate the seasonal people that are heading back to the city. Chelsea, I would like to know, since you are on top of this and you hear from your attendants all the time, What's your recommendation? The rest of us are kind of arm's length critics here. So through you, Mayor Clarkson, I will just answer Councillor Franzen's comment there um, about you know, a happy medium and having the hours on Sundays be from um, 11 till seven as opposed to 10 till six. I did consult with the attendants as you know, they're the boots on the ground and they're the ones that are working in these conditions. And I did receive several comments from the staff to say that they feel that lighting would still become an issue toward the end of the season. Um, this coupled with overcast or suboptimal weather conditions would potentially make lighting an issue. Um, Plus, if sites are open until 7, staff still are required to close down the site. So that's where they're closing the bins um, and they have their regular duties that they need to do on a daily basis where daylight hours may not be available to them. So then answering your question, Mayor Clarkson, um, my recommendation is as stated in my report where we would change the Sunday hours from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. However, I am open to suggestions if, if Council has any other ones. Um, I do know that upon consult, consulting some other staff, um, we wondered about another option of shifting winter and summer hours where we would start summer hours starting um, April 15th and then winter hours would start September 15th. This is something that has recently been brought up and I would want to consult with, again, the transfer station staff um, as they are familiar with the time periods and the daylight issues to see if that would be feasible or if it's all of the month of September where they're having the daylight issues. Well, should we maybe um, uh, receive this report today and have it uh, have her come back with uh, some consideration of the uh, of the uh, options that uh, Chelsea has just given us? I would make the motion to receive the report and send it back for staff to come back with some different options. And also, please, I think you can get the hours of sunset off the internet in terms of what hours are actually an issue from a health safety and health perspective. So that's data that can be collected. Um, I don't think we need subjective input on that. So the motion is to receive the report, direct staff to go back and look at some different options that don't impact level of service so much for our residents. And doesn't cut hours for staff yeah. and create uh, staffing Correct. problems as well. Correct. You want to second, second that? that okay, all in favor? Motion is carried. Thank you, Chelsea. I know there's been a lot of work and, and uh, back and forth with this. Evan, we're going to hear from you. Wonderful, thank you, Mayor Clarkson. Through you, Mayor Clarkson, to members of council, before you, you have the quarter three report for uh, public works. Um, the recommendation is just to receive the report for their information. Um, I'm here to answer any questions you may have that are uh, from reading the report. Thank you. Do we have questions? I don't see any. I don't. Yes. You do have maybe just a comment. I, I just wanted to and thank you Evan, for this. I know this is your first report. Um, that's always the cause when to uh, prepare and present, and I'm not going to grill you. Um, I did just want to point out that in the very last part of it, um, our waste is down uh, in the quarter uh, over the previous quarter, as are the vehicles. Um, so, you know, I think I know we've had a couple of blips in the past, but I think it's positive that our waste, if I'm not wrong, I had made some percentage notes, which I can't find at the moment, but it's down. <laughs> Okay. Yes. I, I'd like to ask a question outside the report, Evan. If you if you're not prepared to answer, maybe get back to me at a later date. Uh, do you feel that the proposed access route to Butte uh, uh, Farms 
uh, is a, a safe access route for the amount of trucks that would be driving on that uh, section of uh, municipal road? Absolutely. Thank you for that question, Councillor Franzen. To you, Councillor Franzen, to you, the mayor. Um, right now, I'm still gathering some information, reviewing the reports that have been done. Obviously, there's been uh, there's a lot of background information on that site, on that road. Um, so at this moment, I'm not prepared to provide a comment on on the hall route um, as I'm still reviewing the data that's been provided. I, I, I appreciate that. That's fair. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, sorry, I found my notes. <laughs> <laughs> Waste is down and the vehicles are down. Too late, too late. 10% <laughs> <laughs> quarter of appropriate, which is pretty impressive given that we are just coming through the end of the summer. Yeah, I think I just to just to provide a outsider's comment on our transfer stations here at the municipality of Trent Lakes, um, coming from another uh, township, I do believe that the attendants here at our transfer stations do an incredible job of trying to enforce the clear bag program and trying to pr promote recycling. Um, and I believe just from an outside comment that that comes from all the hard work that Chelsea has done throughout the years uh, on waste. So um, she just continues to champion that. And I'm Looking forward to continue to support her and all the transfer station staff. Uh, yeah. I think we concur with that. Thank you, Evan. Mm -hmm. uh, can I have a motion to receive that report, please? Uh, Deputy Mayor Windover, Councillor Franzen, all in favor? Motion has carried. Recreation and facilities, Dylan Kosh. Uh, Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, before you, you have my Q3. 2021 report. Um, continuing with our uh, new style here with some some data. Um, I won't uh, go into the nitty gritty, but uh, the short and the long of it. Saw less work orders completed um, from a quantity um, number of work orders standpoint, but hours um, put into smaller or put in number of hours per project increased. We're getting we got more into uh, you know, improving things, more complex projects, um, what have you, really for uh, improving the assets we've got and continuing to maintain them. Um, the There's some pictures there in this one. I'm trying to bring that back a little bit. Uh, we've got the buckhorn roof in there. Um, overall, that job went uh, fairly well. I think it's uh, it'll be, it was a good move to uh, get that replaced with steel. And just some various other projects. I know there were some questions on the timelines regarding the Galway siding project at the last meeting. I think I had left the meeting at that point in time. Um, I was on site this morning. The siding, the new siding um, is about two thirds done on the east side. It's about halfway down in the south. They've got the building approximately 75% strapped and insulated. Um, the contractor foreman, I met with him on site and he indicated um, he's thinking kind of uh, early mid-November they should be able to wrap it up as long as, you know, weather cooperates with them and, and what have you, which should be well ahead of our December 10th deadline for completion. So I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to that being completed. Uh, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Do I see hands? I'm going to make a comment. I have heard so many positive um, feedback, so much positive feedback from you people, from people who run into your helpers at the uh, along the side of the road, to their courteousness, to the flower baskets, and I know what kind of work that's been. Nice to see them taken down it and uh, put away safely. So kudos to you guys. You are doing a wonderful job. Thank you very much, Mayor. Now you're all fired. <laughs> Early vacation. <laughs> okay, can we have a uh, motion to uh, uh, approve that report, please? To accept that report. Councillor Armstrong, Councillor Franzen, all in favor. Steve, I know you've been busy. We've seen your trucks running around like crazy. Mm -hmm. Have you got a report for us? Hello, Steve. Yeah. 
maybe we'll go on to Jesse's until Steve comes back. He may have been he may have been called out. Uh, Jesse, you're going to do the short term. Uh, three. If there's no questions, I'm sure we could just receive Steve's report and move on to the next one. Okay. Um, now I'm not going to make the motion on this one. I'm going to. This no, is I, on on the fire. I'll, I'll repeat the report. Oh, for the fire. To repeat yeah. the report on fire. Okay, so we don't need to wait for Steve. We can no. just let Steve go. All right. Uh, I'll second that motion. I just want to congratulate Steve on uh, being appointed secretary on the board of directors for the Emergency Training Academy. I think it's great for us to be yeah. represented in that level at that level. It's, yeah. And to have him qualified to be accepted at that level. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so Jesse, you're going to do the short term, all and I'm going favor. to. All in favor of my motion. All in favor of that motion. <laughs> that motion is carried. So I'm going to step out for a moment on the short term. Deputy Mayor Wendover, you're now in the chair. Pardon? Mayor Clarkson has decided to address, okay. so yeah. you'll now be the chair okay. for this portion sure. of the meeting. Okay, okay. Good. Sure, yeah. Okay. So through you, Deputy Mayor Windover, the short-term rental working group was directed at the September 7th meeting to develop a public consultation process on the proposed short-term rental licensing program. The working group has developed a short survey to be open to the public November 1st to 19th and arranged for a public information session to be held Tuesday, November 23rd at 9 a.m. These public consultation opportunities will be promoted in a variety of ways uh, through the website, social media, and email contact lists a mail out to all residents and advertisements in a variety of local newspapers and at the transfer stations. After the public input has been gathered, the working group will evaluate all of the data and feedback and report back to council with a final recommendation on whether to proceed with the licensing program as originally proposed. Okay. Any comments? Or... I, 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 uh, I heard that uh, Somebody called me and they that uh, they thought that that uh, wasn't an appropriate time on Tuesday morning at uh, 9 a.m. to have the public meeting. They thought that another time would be more appropriate where more people would be available. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. I just uh, said I would bring the comment forward. I'm not, I'm not opposed to it either way. I, I would make a motion to receive the report and approve the process and just suggest that we're also receiving written consultations if they can't personally be available yeah. for the yeah. 23rd. So they've yeah. got alternatives. Yeah, that's fine. I second that motion. So is Jenna coming back? No, she isn't at all in this day or what? Correct. She's, She's not involved back. in this? Correct. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. So, motion is then to put a word. Motion to receive the report and approve that we proceed with the public consultation process as okay. Uh, recommended. Okay, yeah. All in favor? Yeah. Pass. Lost our Okay, Sarah Del Amateur, and I will, you have to, you, you got to give me phonetics for this. Consent application B7921. Through you, Madam Mayor, on today's agenda, there's a municipal appraisal 
form for consent file B-79-21 submitted by owners Tom and Susan Wheel. The subject land is located on 3805 County Road 36. The application conforms to official plan policies as the proposed use is not changing from the existing residential use. The current land use designa designations for both the retained and severed parcel is rural. The resulting lot addition will increase a 98.75 acre or 40.4 hectare rural parcel to an approximately 146.77 acre or 59.4 hectare rural parcel. Both the severed and retained parcels will comply with the existing comprehensive zoning bylaw B2014-070. Staff have reviewed the application and recommend that council supports the consent application subject to the conditions of a merger agreement. Thank you. Can I have a motion, please? Deputy Mayor yeah. Wendover, Councillor Franzen, all in favor. Motion is carried. Sarah, Del I'm going to do this. Delamar, Delamar chart. Is that close? Delamar <laughs> To yeah. you, Madam Mayor. <laughs> On today's agenda, there is a status memo in relation to the Dudney Mountain Quarry. Further to Council Resolution R2021-372, which directed staff to coordinate peer reviews of the technical reports related to the proposed haul route for the proposed quarry. This status memo is for the Council's information only, so as to inform the members of the status of the file. Excuse me. Uh, can we have a motion, please? And are there any questions? Motion to receive, and I have a question after it's seconded. Okay. Um, mo also, motion by Councillor Armstrong, seconded by Councillor Franzen, and now comments, please. Thank you. Uh, through you, Madam Mayor. Um, excellent work by some of these peer reviews. I mean, very detailed, very thorough. I appreciate it. Um, I'm left with the question of, and I'm building on what Councillor Franzen said earlier, is the alternate hall route viable? <laughs> and I get to the end of the peer review study and I don't know the answer to that question. And so somewhere in this process, we need to make that determination. And I would echo Councillor Franzen's request that we have our own public works director go out and you know, view it himself and get involved in this process. And also, I guess we've not heard from our, our lawyer and a few others. Uh, I have uh, a couple comments as well, please, Mayor. Um, uh, first of all, uh, uh, when you need, read the noise report, they say it's acceptable for a hall route, but it's it, it, it wouldn't be acceptable for normal circumstances. And uh, when you talk about the noise level, we don't know what size of trucks are using. We don't know if they're a, a, a dragging a pup or a trailer. Dragging a pup or a trailer would increase the, the noise significant, significantly. So, and uh, you know, that they're allowing uh, four, four, uh, four, uh, 45, uh, uh, what, dBA, um, the level of the noise. What happens if they exceed that level? Does the hall route get shut down? Donna, I mm -hmm. think I'm going to ask you to comment here because I think we're going to have to bring somebody in that's that's more um, more has more information than what than what we can gather around this table. I think we've had these discussions. I think it's a I think it's an engineer that we're going to need to speak to. I'm not sure that we're not putting Evan on the spot for this for this uh, uh, information. So who do we? I know we've had. Um, uh, John, you were in here different times. What's your, what's your. What's Through your, you, Madam Mayor, if I could provide some comment from a planning yeah, please, perspective. Please do, please do. From a planning perspective, um, the peer reviews are in and they're going back to the initial consultant who prepared the studies in the first place. 
and there's going to be some back and forth and planning will be involved trying to get some answers we too have some shared concerns that council is raising and uh, there's going to be additional work that may be required and we will provide you with all the answers in a further report and we will definitely include the new director of public works as part of our work to bring forward a response back to council so in a nutshell the work isn't complete as of yet and we will attempt to give council all the answers as we go forward would you have a, any kind of a time frame for that um, I don't have an exact time frame. I know that the consultant has reached out to the municipality to arrange a meeting regarding the hall route, and we're just in the process of seeing when that meeting couldn't be arranged. So I still don't have a date regarding that. Okay, but it's not going to be into the new year by any means. It should be done within the next foreseeable future. Would you? I, I know you guys are overwhelmed up there, but. I think there is some urgency to move this forward as well. So, I agree. I don't see it going into the new year. We'll arrange a meeting uh, within the next month. I'm positive about that. Okay, Peter, you have a follow-up. Uh, I, I also had a, a, a rate payer email me on three separate occasions, and he asked, "Why would the quarry go into an environmentally protected zone?" And uh, I haven't been able to answer that question. Um, uh, staff don't have the time to research it. Um, I, I feel somewhat embarrassed that, that it seems like a fairly straightforward question and, uh, and I haven't been able to get an answer. I know Adele passed it on to Chris Jones, but uh, this, this is uh, going on for, I'd say, at least three weeks. You want to comment on that, Adele, or is this just through Madam Mayor, um, as Councillor Franzen has indicated, we've been extremely busy. And when we meet regarding uh, Dudney Mountain, I will certainly try and get all the answers that have been coming forward and um, bring it forward to Council as, as best I can. And I'll inquire about the email that we received regarding that question and ensure we follow up with it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Did you have any more information? Or questions. No, no, okay, that uh, that's that's good. I think we've got what we need from that yeah. report. Uh, all we need now, I think, is is to uh, to vote on it. I think we've got our first and seconder here. All in favor? Okay, so motion is carried. Okay, Barbara Waldron, Director of Public Planning. Good afternoon through you, Madam Mayor. The third quarter report speaks to both building and planning department activity. As this has been a detailed report, I am prepared to answer any questions, but I do want to touch on four items specifically. The building and planning department activity has ramped up over the last few weeks as we approach the winter season, which is typical in any given year. But this increase in activity is also due to files that have been put on hold due to staffing issues and increase in applications. So basically, we work on a triage mode every single day, and we're dealing with um, daily issues that are coming up uh, that need immediate attention. The one thing that we have been strictly enforcing since I've got here is um, that the billing department will not respond verbally to any inquiries which I have been which I imposed upon my arrival. <clears throat> and it is uh, the reasons for a written response is so that staff can take appropriate time to assess all aspects relating to the request of, and the property. And people, when they hear things verbally, they tend to take the positive things that they want to hear out of the conversation and they don't take the rest of the conversation, which is typically what they need to get done. Um, and most importantly, we have a paper trail. But I just wanted to, to say this, that as I work through files and issues coming up on a daily basis, most files are complicated at different stages have many moving parts with many different agencies. So I just want to caution members of council that if you are receiving calls to be very careful of the information that you are providing, 
because we want to ensure that you do not put yourself in a situation of having a possible conflict if any if any planning applications come forward in the future. Um, going over to the building permit activity. Um, so it, it looks all wonderful on paper <laughs> because it says that, you know, our total revenue to the end of September is uh, $427,325.48 and the budgeted revenue was only $358,263. But the reality is, is that the actual cost of the department is, much, is higher this year. Um, and that is due to a fairly substantial amount in the consultant costs line, which is RSM. <clears throat> so we are actually, um, we haven't recovered enough money through revenue to pay for the department yet. But having said that, we still have three months to go. So I just want to, it's not such a good news story, but I thought you needed to know that. Um, under building code enforcement, um, I, another thing that I want to bring to your attention because you might hear chatter out there is we do have a major problem with people building without permits out there and we are going after them when we're finding them and when we are being advised to them but the one thing that we are going to start imposing that has not been imposed in the past or very sparingly is applying penalties. So through our fees and charges bylaw, there are penalties that can be opposed that if we have to issue an order on your property, that you're going to have that penalty applied to you. Um, issuing an order on a property is a lot of paperwork. It's a lot of going out to the property two and three times. Um, there's just a lot. It takes away from, I say, productive days because you're dealing with negative things. Um, so in addition to be getting a penalty, when they do get a building permit, if they can get a building permit, uh, the building permit fee will be doubled as well. So, you know, this message is going to start getting out there that if you get caught, it's going to cost you some, some money. The planning, if you have any questions about planning, I'm going to let Adele answer those questions. So if you have any questions for either one of us, we would be pleased to answer. I'm looking for hands and I see one. Thank you through Madam Mayor. Thanks Barb. I, again, I know it's your first quarterly report, so um, difficult to always uh, get the first one out. Um, I actually wanted to applaud you in moving some of your work plan items over into 2023. Um, that is one of the most difficult things I've seen in terms of managing staff and operations to decide what you're not going to do because it can be postponed and that allows you to focus on the things that do need to get done. And obviously you're dealing with quite a backlog. So I just wanted to point out that you did that. And I think that's a, a very strong leadership move on your part. And I would certainly encourage any departmental manager where we have things that can be shifted to 2023 that won't impact level of service um, that we do that so that we can finish up the year and make sure that we've completed all the, the work that we need to. Okay. Yeah, so I was just wondering if you could tell me the fact of, of uh, this penalty you're talking about, is that sort of like you get something added to your taxes if you didn't have a billing from it? Yeah. So for example, um, if we have to issue, well, the other day uh, a fairly substantial garage was caught that was built without permits so on an accessory structure uh, there is a fee of there's an investigation fee so that is uh, $1,570 if an order is issued that's $523.84 uh, and then there would be the doubling of the fee if a permit is available. If a permit's not available and there's a building up, then we're going down the legal road. But these fees can be put on the taxes because they are imposed through the fees and charges bylaw. What, I, I just, thank you very much. But I was talking, there was a gentleman who saw me and he said that he got charged $200 extra or something on his taxes because of the fact the contract didn't get a billing permit. We're doing something in his house years ago. How does that work out there? Did you catch that question, Barb? Um, 
I'm not going to speak. Well, I don't. I don't know the the property you're speaking to. Number one and number two, I wouldn't speak to it in public until I found out what the actual facts are, and I would relay that information to you. Um, okay, a different thanks. method, but but if a building permit has to be doubled, that building permit fee is paid at the time of before they pick the permit up. Before the permit's issued, they have to pay all fees associated with that, and the building permit fee would be one fee they have to pay if they've built without a permit, and they can do so, like if they don't need any planning, they meet all planning requirements, uh, that building permit fee is paid for prior to the permit being issued. Thank you. Okay, uh, do we have any other questions? I think everybody around this table, uh, Barb, uh, offer you our, <laughs> I wouldn't want to say condolences, <laughs> but <laughs> uh, I think we're certainly, um, we're certainly happy to see you in this position. And I want to extend that to, to Donna. I know you guys are, you're just, you're, uh, you're pushed to the, to the limits and, um, you know, you still keep an attitude to the public that is, uh, is, uh, worth a fortune. So you have our, uh, and the same thing with Adele. I know Adele, you're there somewhere too. So to that whole department and, and the staff in general, you've worked through the, the hardest of times. And for the most part, with a, with a smile on your face, you're a good bunch and you're proud of the works of you. So if we can get a, if we can get a, um, a motion to uh, receive that report, that would be Deputy Mayor Windover and Councillor Franzen, all in favor, you got it. Suzanne, where is Curly? Finance. Hi there. Good afternoon, Mayor Clarkson, Deputy Mayor, and members of Council. Before you today is the 2022 Ontario Provincial Police Billing Statement. The finan financial implications are $1,624,740. In 2022, an estimated per property cost of $228.90, plus a 2020 reconciliation amount for a grand total of $1,642,167. As attached, we now have received the 2022 OPP billing statement and accompany accompanying summaries. The recommendation before you is that Council receives the Acting Deputy Treasurer's 2022 Billing Statement Report for information purposes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Do we have questions? Seeing none, can we have a motion? Councillor or Deputy Mayor Windover? Yes. Motion to receive the report. And can we have a seconder? A and, seconder and, and always good to see a decrease in the billing from OPP. So that's great news. <laughs> Thank you for bringing that. <laughs> All in favor, motion is carried. Donna Taggart, counts payable. Great. Thank you through you, Madam Mayor. Counts payable for the month of September for your information. Okay. Uh, motion to uh, receive this report. Uh, Councillor Armstrong. Councillor Franzen, all in favor. And now the surplus funds to reserves. And, and that we get carried. So thank you and through you. Uh, as we do annually, I'm looking for a motion from Council to support transferring any unspent, unspent funds from 2021 into reserves for future use. Okay, motion please. For questions, yes. I'll make that motion to approve. Okay, Councillor Armstrong, seconder, Deputy Mayor Wendover, all in favor. Donna, what kind of interest do we get on these surplus funds? Through you, Madam Mayor. Uh, right now, 0.80% is the interest rate, so it's not all that high at the moment. Um, but yes, that's that's what we're receiving. Okay. Um, finance 2021 Q3 report. Right, so thank you and through you. Just the uh, report for your information of the quarter three um, initiatives and I'm here to answer any questions if you have any. Do we have questions? Motion to repeat. Thank you very much, Councillor Franson, Councillor Armstrong, all in favor, motion is carried. 
Lynn Holtz, Economic Development Officer, Celebrate Canada Day. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor and members of Council. Speaking through you, Madam Mayor, you have before you a report seeking Council's direction on the annual Canada Day funding application. The request is that Council consider directing staff to inform the three recipient organizations that the municipality will no longer be applying for Canada Day funding and that they are encouraged, if they are not already doing so, to apply for the funding on their own. I am happy to respond to any questions. I don't think we knew that there was being funded the other way. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Armstrong. Yep, thank you, you Madam just, just a quick question, Lynn. Are, are the, these other organizations aware that this is coming up for a, a vote by council and that they may be on their own in the future? Or will this be a surprise to them? <laughs> it has been uh, put to them as a question once before about whether they wanted us to continue. And at that time, they said that they did. Um, but the government itself is kind of making it more difficult for a municipality to, to apply on behalf of the not-for-profits. Um, so they won't be aware of it, but that's why we thought we'd bring it to you as soon as possible because there is a November 22nd closing. Um, um, I think most of them are already applying for funding, so it may just be a matter of asking for a little bit more and providing that explanation in their uh, application. Thank you. Thought she forgot to turn the calendar over. Yes. Uh, I had a comment from Paul Kelly from the Parks and Rec and Culture, and uh, he thought it might be a good idea to refer that to that committee. Uh, there might be some groups that would be interested in the Canada Day celebration. But they don't yeah. have a budget, so what would be the point? But there would be other organizations that might be interested in putting on Canada Day and, and receiving some funding. His ask was quite simple. It's a suggestive reverse committee, and the committee would, uh, would give a recommendation to council. Mm -hmm. Yes. So through you, Madam Mayor, um, the report today is uh, for the municipality to step away from this. That is what uh, Lynn brought forward. So it's more to have the, any group that wants to apply would do that on their own. So mm -hmm. it's, you know, typical in the past, Lynn has spent a lot of time applying for and she has to do the reporting on the use of the funding as well. So based on the changes under the program, we believe that it's better for the organizations to go ahead and apply that would like to and obtain their own financial uh, grants. So the motion is to uh, receive this report, yes? So I would make the motion to receive the support, uh, the report, sorry, and we certainly support the recommendation that, that staff uh, uh, delegates this responsibility back to the uh, individual organizing organizations. I think okay. this is a good move to reduce our workload where it's, there's no value added. Oh, you can. And Deputy yeah. Mayor Window, you yeah. a second? All in favor? Motion is carried. Okay, uh, request for water service connections. <laughs> and Councillor Branson has left the room. So thank you and through you. So there has been a request put forward um, for the addition of a service connection at 65 Alpine Lake Road. Uh, we have done this before. We have added service connections uh, at requests as long as it is covered entirely by the individual that is um, having the new service. So Aqua did obtain some amounts uh, to do this work because there is some directional drilling required. And it would be a total cost of $13,263.86. They did advise that uh, Council should consider any future requests for additions to this service um, because probably it's at the max or close to, but that this connection would not cause any difficulty whatsoever. So I'm looking for support to uh, approve the connection at 65 Alpine Lake Road and that the costs be borne entirely by the individual that is, will have that connection. Okay, 
Uh, questions? Just motion to approve. Uh, Deputy Mayor Wendell. Yeah. Councilor Armstrong. I would second the motion to receive the report and approve that uh, okay. connection. Yeah. All in favor? Donna, would it be would it be worthwhile to have Aqua uh, do a little bit of homework to find out just what uh, capacity is left, so that if people are buying or whatever, they would know ahead of time whether or not it was it was feasible that they would be able to hook up. Because if they can't, a lot of those areas would probably have trouble with wells. So through you, the hookups would be for individuals. Right now, if there is a line going by your property and it's vacant, you could hook to it. It's more, these are individuals that are putting actual new connections that are currently not connected. So it wouldn't be an issue for the vacant properties already there. It's more, these people don't have any service to their property at all right now. So it's not a, it's not a water a quantity problem. It's the, the serviceability. So through you, it could be a water quantity problem if we added additional ones that already don't have the line running by their property. But we can certainly have Aqua speak to that or do some more work on that. But the issue is um, more, there's people that want to add on to the water system that currently don't have the service running by their property. And that's what this property is. So the capability is there for them to hook up at this point? Yes. Okay. Because if you have a double lot, you're paying uh, two bills. You're paying double your water bill. If you, know you, only if you have an extra separate lot adjoining your property, you're paying two water bills. Even though you're only drawing for one. Well, yeah, even though you're only drawing for one. So when was that set up hmm. that way? Because that doesn't sound right. So through you. Um, it's my understanding from the creation of that water system, it was always meant to have everybody that, so it's based on your assessment role. So if you have a roll number, you pay towards that water system, whether you have a connection or not, because you could connect essentially. So it's a way to afford, it's a user pay water system um, and the cost can be very high and it's a way to spread the cost over everyone. And the idea was always that that individual that had a vacant property could build and hook to that water system at any time. Is it is it would it be worthwhile to have Aqua come and do a presentation and take questions? I don't think we've done that this term. So through you, uh, Aqua typically come annually at budget time, and this day that I bring the water budgets, they always come and give a, an overview of the previous year, and they're there to answer any questions. But okay. we can have them come anytime if council wish. Well, it might be uh, it might be. Uh, Interesting. Okay, um, we've got an answer. I just want to ask, Donna, there isn't like there isn't a separate bill as if you I put like let's say a vacant lot and it costs you know half a million dollars to really do the water system, right? Do you if if well one day you, so you got you got to pay that had three separate lots and you were paying three bills. Yeah, that's he amalgamated true. them into one lot and he only got one bill. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But then, if he wants say, to yeah. sell, he's got. To they, they should be. They, they should have to keep, keep up with the cost yeah. of that yep. system. Yeah. That's a, that's a dangerous protocol. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, motion to receive this uh, report. Uh, Deputy Mayor Windover. Yes. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Windover has already moved, and Councilor Armstrong what, seconded. You did call for the vote, but you haven't stated the outcome. Okay. Uh, all in favor? Motion is carried. Okay, uh, administration, Donna, work so, plans. Right, so thank you and through you. Uh, for council's information, uh, the quarterly report for administration and associated work plans, if there are any questions. Do we have questions? And if not, a motion to receive this report. Motion to receive the report. Okay, okay Councillor Armstrong, Councillor Franzen, all in favor? Motion is carried. And Ruth, Deputy Clerk, Community Safety Zone for Galway Road. Uh, thank you, through you, Mayor Clarkson, to Council. Uh, at the May 18th, 2021 Council meeting, staff were directed to report back to Council with data collected 
and considerations uh, in establishing a community safety zone on Galway Road in the area of the Galway Hall and Fire Station. Under the Highway Traffic Act, Council of a Municipality may, by bylaw, designate a part of a highway under its jurisdiction as a community safety zone if, in Council's opinion, public safety is of special concern on that part of the highway. This report brings forward information and considerations regarding implementation of a community safety zone, speed and collision data provided by the OPP for the identified area, and comments from the directors of Public Works, Parks and Facilities, and Emergency Services in regards to this matter. Thank you. Okay, uh, I want a motion and comment. Comments, motion. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> <laughs> They've gone home. Mm -hmm. Donna, they went home. <laughs> I'm going home too. <laughs> Thanks for this, uh, and I, um, I'm not sure where to go with this. I'm, I'm happy to make a motion to receive the report. Uh, I don't know where we go beyond that in terms of community safety zone. I know we've got yeah. three requests in for community safety zones. Two are on county roads. One is on our road. Um, and I don't know whether we should be prioritizing them or what. So. I guess I would, the only question I would have is, do you have a recommendation at this point for council or would you like us to just receive the report at this point in time? Uh, thank you, I'm... Master you. Go ahead. No, i wait for you. Oh, I was going to, um, I will second this, but with a comment. Uh, I would like to see that safety zone uh, extend past where the uh, community center is and where the fire hall is. That is an extremely dangerous place to come out of. Uh, will it reduce the um, the speeds the way we would like to see? Um, it's got it's got to help. Eventually, we've got to knock the top off that hill, but that isn't going to happen anytime soon. But that's probably one of the most uh, dangerous um, uh, interchanges that we have in this municipality. So I would I would support a community safety zone. Yes. Three Redcox, and I believe, and I'll clarify with Councillor Armstrong that the motion was just to receive the report that you moved. That's correct. So then. <laughs> Sorry, that was my question. That was the Okay. Um, then we're going to. We're going to vote on uh, Councillor Armstrong's whatever, and then I'm going to put a second one through if, we, if that's possible. Anybody want a second, uh, Councillor Armstrong? Sure. Deputy Mayor Franzen, or Councillor Franzen. All in favor? Okay, I'm going to, uh, is this, is this uh, appropriate to make another motion at this point? Um, about this topic, yes, but you'll need to remove yourself from the chair before making a motion. Okay. I will. I am removed. Ron, you're in charge. <laughs> okay, I will make the motion. I just made the motion, but I couldn't make the motion. So, I, so I'm going to make the motion that we do put the community safety zone in in the, in the uh, proximity of the fire hall and the and the Galway Hall uh, because of the. Uh, the extreme dangers of people pulling up there. Second. Oh, okay. All in favor? Before we do that, oh, sorry. Could, could we ask um, uh, the deputy clerk if, if the staff had a recommendation coming out of this report? Um, I just feel like we're jumping the gun a little bit in terms of a solution. Thank you. Through you, Mayor Clarkson, to Councillor Armstrong. Uh, the report was intended to bring information to Council. Uh, the report did include some comments from uh, several of our directors and specifically the Director of Public Works who had suggested some potential alternatives uh, uh, regarding uh, other com traffic calming measures that could be utilized. Uh, uh, the Director may wish to, to provide some comment on that. Uh, I would also wish to just note that should council choose to move forward with implementation of a community safety zone, uh, the act does require that the bylaw designate um, 
designating a community safety zone specify the hours, days, and months when the designation is in effect. Uh, we would also need to ensure that we determine the exact locations where the boundary signs would be posted. So if I may suggest that uh, Council consider, uh, should they choose to move forward, uh, that they direct staff to report back uh, with uh, a detailed recommendation. Yes. I would agree with the recommendation, but I would also like to say that for the safety of our firefighters and the people that, yes. that use that community center, I think that it should be a community safety zone. Definitely. So then we'll refer this to staff to come back with the with the details. What's the recommendation? The recommendation. Okay. Um, so we've got our motion. Uh, all in favor of that? Sorry, through you, Mayor Coxon. Uh, Deputy Mayor Windover's in the chair. Okay. All in favor? May I just clarify yeah. what the motion is, please? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, the <laughs> council directs staff to report back with a detailed recommendation on declaring a community safety zone on Galway Road. Mm -hmm. That's good. Okay, thank you. Good. You can call for the vote now. Pardon? You can call for the vote now. Oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah, okay. Yeah, good. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, uh, and again, supply and delivery of a, of a truck. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Through you, Mayor Clarkson to Council. Uh, tender T-06-2021 for the supply and delivery of one 2022 half-ton four-door crew cab short box 4x4 pickup truck was posted on September 16th and closed on October 21st. One bid was received and reviewed for compliance. Staff are recommending award of the tender to the lowest compliant bidder being Boyer, Ford, Lincoln, Bob Cajun Limited. Thank you. Okay, what happened to the request for a four door for Barb? Yeah. Did we did we ever do anything about that? Because she was going to the the idea was that she needed one to do the studies, yes. Through you, Mayor Clarkson, I believe that was a 2022 budget item and they're uh, purchasing and public or in building and planning are in the process of developing specifications Perfect. for the procurement. Okay, so then we just need a motion to accept this one. Um, motion to support the Thank you, Councillor Franson, Councillor Armstrong, all in favor, motion is carried. Anne Ruth, council expenses for September and the remainders of July. Motion is Thank you. Okay, Council, uh, Deputy Mayor Windover, Councillor Armstrong, nope. No. I never thought Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, Councillor okay. Franson, all in favor? Jesse, evening meeting considerations. Thank you. Uh, through you, Mayor Clarkson, at the August 10th meeting, through notice of motion, staff were directed to report back on evening meeting considerations. For the past 15 years, council meetings have been held during the day, with the exception of summer, summer meetings in 2019 and 2020, which resulted in meetings ending between 8.16 and 9.33 at night. Currently, only three of the eight lower tier municipalities hold evening meetings. While information on age and employment status are not required when filing nomination papers for council, staff feel there have been a range for, um, of nominees and a change in meeting time will not guarantee the age or employment status of nominees. Any candidates for mayor or deputy mayor will need to be available for daytime meetings for county council as well. And when contemplating a change in meeting time outside of employees' normal working hours, consideration must be given to staff availability Regular council meetings on average run two hours and 45 minutes. Allowing staff to bank time for this will impact service levels as staff would be out of the office more regularly, which would impact the turnaround time for responses to ratepayers and reports back to council. Staff and consultants may have previous commitments outside of normal working hours that would make it difficult to accommodate evening meetings. The municipality may need to take extra precautions to ensure staff are compliant with the provisions of the Employment Standards Act as well. With evening meetings, driving conditions must also be considered. Sunset can occur as early as 5 p.m. in the winter and as late as 9 p.m. in the summer, meaning staff and council will be driving more at night. During the winter months, months there may be poor driving conditions at the conclusion of evening meetings due to snow plowing operations. Consideration was also given to committees and the original advertisement for committee members 
um, advertised a 5 p.m. start time and both committees have switched to daytime meetings. Uh, given all of the considerations outlined in the report, staff do not recommend evening meetings due to the impact on levels of service, staff resources, and safety. Councilor Armstrong. Uh, thank you. I'd like to make a motion to defer this and the following item to our next council meeting when we have a full conference. Yep, I agree. Uh, Councilor Franton. I'll, I'll second. You want to second that? All in favor? Thank you, Jesse. Uh, Jesse, council meeting calendar. Thank you, Three Mayor Clarkson. The procedure bylaw outlines that a report be prepared in the fourth quarter of each year, identifying the following year's meeting date. Meetings are generally held on the first and third Tuesday of each month, and during the months of July and August, August only one regular meeting is held. In accordance with the procedure bylaw, staff have prepared a calendar for 2022 regular meeting dates, with exceptions in January, March, October, and November, as outlined in the report. Special meetings for the community grant requests, uh, ratepayer cottage association meeting, inaugural council meeting, and 2023 budget meeting were also included. Staff are looking for approval and adoption of the 2022 council meeting dates. Okay. If I may ask, through you, this is just the dates, so this is not locking us into any times. So we could make this motion separately from the previous one. Through you, uh, yes, the procedure bylaw does currently state that meetings will be out at 1 p.m., but if we were to change that, I would assume that the meeting dates would stay the same. Um, however, we would be approving the times for the special meetings, uh, which I don't believe there was any issue with, but um, if there is, we can defer this as well. So we're just going to receive this for the way it is now. My recommendation would be we defer this to the next meeting. Yeah. This one too? Since we are able to. Okay. It, that'll still be the fourth quarter, and then we'll have a full complement. I'll second that motion. Okay. All in favor? That's carried. Conferences, uh, Roma and Ogra, delegation requests. Thank you, through you, Mark Clarkson. Every year, council members typically attend one conference. Uh, the dates and locations, if available, of each of the conferences were outlined in the report. Staff are looking for direction on which council members will be attending each conference. And should council choose to send members to Roma and or Ogra, staff are looking for direction on which, if any, ministries to delegate delegations, to request delegations and the topic for each delegation. So I think, again, we receive this and mm -hmm. uh, give this some thought eh? you, you, because you, we can't make these decisions today. For you, you, you may make decisions today. You are a forum of council. No, but I mean, we don't. <laughs> we need to think about this. <laughs> Uh, motion to defer until we have a full conference. <laughs> Here we go again. <laughs> okay, and you're going to second that. Okay. <laughs> From what I can tell, there's no no um, no view in sight that we're going to do these in person. It's going to continue this this way. Okay, all in favor? That motion is carried. We're going to have a lot of deferrals here. Well, Terry's fault. That's Sherry's fault. Yeah. We could have pulled his tooth. It wouldn't have had anything to do with him at all. We could have just knocked him out and done it. Corporate services, Q3 report, Jesse. Thank you. Hoping for not a deferral for this one, but I have a Q3 report, which shows the resolutions, the outstanding resolutions from council, as well as items that were completed in Q3. Um, and my report also outlines the future goals and the accomplishments of the corporate services department in Q3. Well done. Motion, please. Motion, please. Yeah. To receive. I'd like to defer this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're going to second this? Yeah. Councilor Franzen, all in favor? Sorry, who was the mover? Uh, uh, who, whoever. Whichever. It, it was uh, it was Carol. Okay. Correspondence for information. Uh, I think we'll have a motion to accept all of these, please. Councilor Franzen. Councillor Armstrong, all in favor? Correspondence for action, there aren't any. Bylaws, there aren't any. Business arising out of a previous meeting. Does anybody want to bring anything forward? Notices of motion. Again, anybody want to bring a notice of motion? Uh, liaison reports for external boards. Anybody? Uh, have been attending a board meeting that they'd like to speak to? Yes. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I think this should have 
come up earlier, but just in terms of the library, um, the library uh, is making is open to making copies of vaccine cer certificates for anybody who wants to have that service. So just wanted to pass that along. Um, and also there are new computers at the Buckhorn Library that are available for um, public use. Um, they had a problem with the numbers and the functionality before, but that's now uh, that's now in place. Uh, Councillor Armstrong, I have a question. I checked with Dylan, and he said there really is no reason that the goodbye room can't open. So is that something that you can bring to? Because I understand it's under the library. That's correct. Because there are an awful lot of people right now who are scrounging to try to find clothing and whatever, and I know people's clothing is piling up. I can certainly bring that forward. I know it has been discussed, and it's really a safety and health issue not only for the volunteers, but the people that come in. It's a very small space, it mm -hmm. has very poor ventilation. And at this stage, they felt with uh, until the uh, numbers come down and we have a higher vaccination rate, which as Donna shared with us, is only 63% um, for the municipality. Uh, I think the board felt that it should remain closed for the balance of the year. Yeah, because all of Ontario today only had 331 cases. And what these smaller ones have done is that they've allowed one person in. So as long as there's two people in there who are fully vaccinated, and I guess it's up to it's up to them whether or not they want to take that. But can I speak to that issue? Sure. Uh, when we only have 62% of the people in the municipality, and we have some of the employees that uh, work at our library that are immune compromised, um, we're putting their lives at risk. When we reach 80% within the municipality. I would support it 100 percent, but when we only have 62 percent and people want to prolong this uh, this uh, uh, virus that we have without getting vaccinated, I, I, I think we have to be very, very careful. I wouldn't want to be responsible. Well, I wouldn't either, but I think people are getting to, well, yeah. we are to the point that if we want to go in somewhere, we show that. If we if we don't show that, we don't go in. Anyway, it's a library issue, and I say I thought Dylan would be would be a good source to go to initially. Yeah. Yeah. And he said he saw no no reason for that. Uh, if that doesn't work, maybe we can actually find a way to to uh, get some materials out there for people because it is a shame to have the type of uh, of affluence that we have and have the amount of people in this municipality that are joining without. It's not uh, it's not right. So I'll get you to follow up on that if you would. I will raise it again. As I said, I think the policy was to keep it closed for the balance of the year. I will just bring forward you know, the comment and, and have it reviewed, but and maybe we could put some friends and says if we're only at 62% vaccination rate in the municipality, then that is not a good place to be. Okay, so we've we've done the thing on this we just we did the vote on this one did we not no Jesse? vote necessary okay um so we don't have any this was just a, re a comment that i had for you we don't have a report here right correct yeah okay so do we have any other information items anybody want to bring anything forward closed meeting we don't have one Business arising from a closed meeting, we still don't have one. We need a motion for the confirming bylaw. Deputy Mayor Windover, Councillor Franson, all in favor. Thank you. Motion has carried. Motion to adjourn. <laughs> Deputy Mayor Windover, Councillor Franson, Councillor Armstrong, Donna Taggart, and Jesse. Thank you, folks. Well done. Just call for the vote. Oh, call for the vote. All in favor, we did it.